Why does the United States so strongly support Israel? In this video today, I'm going to be explaining the geopolitical and economic reasons why Israel is such an important part of U.S. foreign policy and Washington's attempt to dominate not only the region of the Middle East, but really the entire world. And for this analysis today, I had the privilege of being joined by the economist Michael Hudson. I will bring him in later to provide further details about this topic. But first, I want to highlight some very important basic context to understand this relationship. It is crucial to stress that Israel is an extension of U.S. geopolitical power in one of the most critically important regions of the world. In fact, it was current U.S. President Joe Biden back in 1986 when he was a senator who famously said that if Israel didn't exist, the United States would have to invent it. Is if we look at the Middle East, I think it's about time we stop those of us who support, as most of us do, Israel in this body, for apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made. None. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. I am with my colleagues who are on the floor in the Foreign Relations Committee, and we worry at length about NATO. And we worry about the eastern flank of NATO, Greece and Turkey, and how important it is. They pale by comparison. They pale by comparison in terms of the benefit that accrues to the United States of America. First of all, it goes without saying that the so-called Middle East, or a better term is West Asia, has some of the world's largest reserves of oil and gas, and the entire global economy, infrastructure all around the world, relies on fossil fuels. We are moving toward new energy sources, but they are absolutely critical to the entire global economy. And Washington's goal has been to make sure that it can maintain steady prices in the global oil and gas market. But this is about something much bigger than just oil and gas. The stated U.S. military's policy since the 1990s, since the end of the Cold War and the overthrow of the Soviet Union, is that the United States has tried to maintain control over every region of the world. This was stated very clearly by the U.S. National Security Council in 1992 in the so-called Wolfowitz Doctrine, and the U.S. National Security Council wrote very clearly that Washington's goal is to preclude any hostile power from dominating a region critical to our interests and also thereby to strengthen the barriers against the reemergence of a global threat to the interests of the U.S. and our allies. And the regions it specifically named were Europe, East Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East slash Persian Gulf. And the U.S. National Security Council warned that if a foreign power controlled the resources of such a critical region, it could generate a significant threat to our security. Then in 2004, the U.S. government published its national military strategy in which Washington stressed that its goal was full spectrum dominance. Quote, the ability to control any situation or defeat any adversary across the range of military operations. Now, historically, when it came to the Middle East, the U.S. relied on a so-called twin pillar strategy. The West pillar was Saudi Arabia and the East pillar was Iran. And until the 1979 revolution in Iran, the country was governed by a dictator, a shah, the monarch, who was backed by the United States and served U.S. interests in the region. However, with the 1979 revolution, the U.S. lost one of the pillars of its twin pillar strategy, and Israel became increasingly important for the United States to maintain control over this crucially strategic region. It's not just the massive oil reserves and gas reserves in the region. It's not just the fact that many of the world's top oil and gas producers are located in West Asia. 
It's also the fact that some of the most important trading routes on Earth also go through this region. It would be difficult to overstate how important Egypt's Suez Canal is. This connects trade from the Middle East going into Europe, from the Red Sea into the Mediterranean, and around 30% of all of the world's shipping containers go through the Suez Canal. That represents around 12% of the total global trade of all goods. And then directly south of the Suez Canal, where the Red Sea enters the Arabian Sea, you have a crucial geostrategic choke point known as the Bab al-Mandab Strait right off the coast of Yemen. And there, more than 6 million barrels of oil go through every single day. Historically, the United States has tried to dominate this region in order to maintain control not only of energy supplies, but also to ensure these global trade routes that the entire globalized neoliberal economic system is built on. And as U.S. influence in the region has weakened with an increasingly multipolar world, Israel has become increasingly important for the United States to try to maintain control. We can see this clearly in the discussions over oil prices through OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, which has essentially been expanded and it's now known as OPEC Plus to include Russia. And now Saudi Arabia and Washington's arch enemy Russia play a key role in determining global oil prices. Historically, Saudi Arabia was a loyal U.S. proxy, but increasingly, Riyadh has been maintaining a more non-aligned foreign policy. And a very big reason for that is that China is now the biggest trading partner of many of the countries in the region. And for a decade, China has been the largest importer of oil and gas from the Persian Gulf. Furthermore, through its global infrastructure project, the Belt and Road Initiative, China is moving the center of world trade back to Asia. And in the Belt and Road Initiative, the road in particular is a reference to the new Silk Road. Can you guess which region is absolutely crucial in the new Silk Road and the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, of course, it's the Middle East, or again, a better term is West Asia. And that term actually much better explains the geostrategic importance of this region because it connects Asia to Europe. And this also explains why the United States has been so desperate to try to challenge the Belt and Road with its own attempts to build new trade routes. In particular, the U.S. is trying to make a trade route going from India into the Persian Gulf, and then up through Israel. So in all of these projects, Israel plays an important role as an extension of U.S. imperial power in one of the most important regions of the world. That is why Biden said back in 1986 that if Israel didn't exist, the U.S. would have to invent it. That's also why Biden repeated this in 2022. We're also going to discuss the ironclad commitment and this is, I'll say this 5,000 times in my career, the Iron Tag Clad Commitment the United States has to Israel based on our principles, our ideas, our values. They're the same values. And uh, I, uh, I've often said, Mr. President, if there, uh, were, if there were not in Israel, we'd have to invent one. And even as recently as October 18th, 2023, Biden once again repeated the same thing in a speech he made in Israel. Long said, if Israel didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. In that speech in 2023, Biden traveled to Israel in order to support the country as it was carrying out a brutal bombing campaign in Gaza and ethnically cleansing Palestinians as part of what many experts around the world have referred to as a textbook example of genocide. Top United Nations experts have warned that the Palestinian people are in danger of genocide by Israel, and the United States has steadfastly been supporting Israel because, once again, as Joe Biden said, Israel is an extension of U.S. imperial power in West Asia, and if it didn't exist, Washington would have to invent it. Now, on that note, I'm going to go to the interview that I did with friend of the show, Michael Hudson, 
the brilliant economist and author of many books, including Super Imperialism, The Economic Strategy of American Empire. Here's a brief clip from our conversation. Israel is uh, its uh, landed aircraft carrier in the Near East. Israel is the takeoff point for America to control uh, the Near East. The United States has always viewed Israel as uh, just our uh, foreign military base. Uh, when England first uh, passed the uh, the act uh, saying that there should be uh, in Israel, the Balfour Declaration, it was because Britain wanted to control the Near East and its oil supplies. And then after that, of course, uh, when uh, Truman in, uh, came in uh, in the military, the military uh, immediately saw uh, that it was uh, America was replacing England as uh, the chief uh, of the Near East. Uh, wh what we're really seeing is uh, uh, having fought uh, Russia to the last Ukrainian and threatening to fight uh, uh, Iran to the last uh, uh, Israeli, the United States is, is trying to uh, uh, send arms to uh, Taiwan to say, wouldn't you like to fight to the last Taiwanese against uh, China? Uh, and that's really the U.S. strategy all over the world. Uh, it, it's trying to fuel other countries to fight wars for its own control. Michael, thanks for joining me today. We are speaking on November 9th, and the latest death toll in the war in Gaza is that Israel has killed more than 10,000 Palestinians. The United Nations has referred to Gaza as a cemetery of children. More than 4,000 children have been killed. That's about 40% of the casualties are children. And the United States has continued to support Israel, not only diplomatically and politically, not only by, for instance, vetoing resolutions in the UN Security Council that call for a ceasefire, but furthermore, the US has been sending billions of dollars to Israel. Not only the $3.8 billion that the US always gives to Israel every year in military aid, but additionally, tens of billions of dollars more. So I'm wondering if you could provide your analysis of why you think the US is investing so many resources in supporting Israel while it's clearly committing war crimes. Well, the, uh, certainly it is uh, uh, supporting Israel, but it's not supporting Israel because uh, uh, this is um, uh, a is altruistic act. Uh, the, to the United States, uh, Israel is uh, its uh, landed aircraft carrier in the Near East. Israel is the takeoff point for America to control uh, the Near East. And from the very time uh, there was talk of creating an Israel, it was always that Israel was going to be an outpost, first of England, then of Russia, then of the United States uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the Near East. And uh, I can give you an anecdote. Uh, uh, Netanyahu's main national security advisor for the last few years uh, has been Uzi Arad. Uh, I worked at the Hudson Institute for about uh, five years, 1972 to 76, and uh, I worked very closely with Uzi there. Uzi and I made uh, two trips to uh, Korea and Japan uh, to talk about international finance. So we had a good chance to uh, uh, get to know each other. And on, on one trip, we uh, stopped uh, over uh, from New York to San Francisco. And in San Francisco, there was a, uh, a party or a gathering uh, for uh, people to meet us. And uh, one of the uh, U.S. generals uh, came over and slapped Uzi on the back and said, you're our landed aircraft carrier over there. You know, uh, we love you. Well, I could see Uzi feeling tightening up and getting very uh, uh, embarrassed and didn't really have anything to say. But the United States has always viewed Israel as uh, just our uh, foreign military base, uh, not Israel. So, of course, it wants to secure this military base. Uh, but when uh, the uh, when England first uh, passed the, uh, the act uh, saying that there should be uh, in Israel, the Balfour Declaration, it was because Britain wanted to control the Near East and its oil supplies. Uh, when uh, Israel was formed in the United Nations, the first country to recognize it was Stalin and Russia 
who thought that Russians were going to have uh, a major influence over Israel. And then after that, of course, uh, when uh, Truman and, uh, came in uh, in the military, the military uh, immediately saw uh, that it was uh, America was replacing England as uh, the chief uh, of the Near East. Uh, and uh, that was uh, even after uh, the fight, the overthrow of the Mossadegh government in Iran in 1953. So from the United States, uh, it, it, it's not uh, Israel's uh, wagging uh, the American tail, just the opposite. Uh, the uh, You mentioned that America is supporting Israel. Uh, I don't think America is supporting Israel at all, uh, nor do most Israelis, nor do most Democrats. America is supporting Netanyahu. It's supporting Likud not Israel. The, uh, the uh, majority of uh, Israelis, certainly the uh, non-religious uh, Israelis, the, uh, early, the core population of uh, Israel since its uh, founding, uh, is opposing uh, Likud in its uh, policies. Uh, and uh, so uh, what really is happening is that uh, to the United States, Netanyahu is the Israeli version of Zelensky in uh, in the Ukraine, and the advantage of having such an unpleasant, opportunist, and corrupt person as Netanyahu, who is under uh, indictment for uh, his bribery and corruption, is precisely that uh, all of the attention now uh, of the whole world that is so appalled by the attacks going on in Ga Gaza, they're not blaming the United States. They're blaming. Israel. They're blaming Netanyahu and Israel for it when it's the United States that has been sending plane load after plane load of bombs, of guns. Uh, there are 22,000 machine guns, uh, automatic uh, uh, guns that are banned for sale in the United States that America is sending for the settlers to use on the West Bank. So uh, there's a, a pretense of good cop, bad cop. Uh, you have Mr. Blinken uh, telling Netanyahu, when you bomb hospitals, make sure you do it according to the rules of war. And uh, when you kill 100,000 uh, Gaza children, make sure it's all legal and in the, uh, in, in the war. And when you talk about ethnic cleansing and uh, 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 driving a population out, make sure that it's all done legal. Well, of course, it's not the rules of war. Uh, and uh, there are war crimes being committed. But uh, the United States is pretending to tell uh, uh, Netanyahu and uh, the Israeli government use use smaller bombs. Be more gentle when you bomb the, the children in the hospital. When actually this is all for show. Uh, the United States is trying to say, uh, well, you know, it's uh, we're only there to give uh, help to an ally. Uh, but as you, the whole world has noticed that the U.S. now has two aircraft carriers uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, right off. Uh, uh, the uh, the Near Eastern uh, Shore, and it has an atomic submarine uh, near the Persian Gulf. Uh, uh, why are they there? Uh, President Biden and Congress says we are not going to have American troops fighting Hamas in uh, Gaza. Uh, we're not going to get involved. Well, if the troops are not going to get involved, why are they there? Well, we know what the American planes are doing. Uh, yesterday, they bombed uh, uh, yet another airport uh, uh, and a, a, fu uh, a fuel depot in Syria. They're bombing Syria. Uh, and it's very clear uh, that they're there not to uh, protect Israel, but to fight Iran. Again and again, uh, every uh, American newspaper, uh, when it talks about uh, Hamas, it says uh, Hamas acting on behalf of Iran. When it talks about uh, Hezbollah, and uh, is there going to be uh, an interve intervention from uh, Lebanon uh, in, in, against uh, northern Israel, they say Hezbollah uh, and uh, uh, the Iranian puppets. Uh, they and they and any time they talk about any Near Eastern leader, it's really that all these leaders are puppets of Iran, just like uh, in. Uh, uh, in uh, the Ukraine and Central Europe, uh, they talk about 
uh, uh, Hungary and uh, uh, other countries, all being puppets of uh, Putin uh, in in Russia. Uh, they uh, their focus really. Uh, America isn't trying to to fight to protect uh, uh, the Ukraine. It's fighting to, for the last Ukrainian to be exhausted in what they'd hoped would be depleting uh, Russia's uh, military. Well, it ha it hasn't worked. Well, the same thing uh, in Israel. Uh, if uh, the, the the United States is is pushing uh, uh, Israel and, and Netanyahu to uh, escalate, 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 to do something that at a point is going to lead uh, Nasrallah to finally say, "Okay, we can't take it anymore. We're uh, we're coming in and uh, helping rescue." Uh, the Gazians, and especially rescue the West Bank, where uh, just as much fighting is taking place. Uh, we're going. We're going to come in, and that's when the United States will then uh, uh, feel free to move not only against Lebanon but all the way via uh, uh, Syria, Iraq uh, to Iran. Uh, what we're seeing in Gaza and, uh, and the West Bank today is only the catalyst, the trigger for uh, the, the fact that the neocons say we are never going to have a better chance than we have right now to conquer Iran. So uh, this, is, this is the point for the showdown, that if America is to control Near Eastern oil, and by controlling Near Eastern oil, by bringing it under uh, the U.S. control, it can control the energy uh, 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 imports of much of the world. And uh, therefore, it, this gives American diplomats the power to cut off oil and gas uh, as, and to sanction any country that uh, tries to go U multipolar, any country that tries to resist uh, U.S. unipolar uh, uh, control. Yeah, Michael, I think you're really hitting such an important point, which is how this is one of the most geostrategic regions of the world especially when it comes to hydrocarbons, the entire global economy is still very heavily reliant on oil and gas. And especially considering the US is not part of OPEC, and especially now considering that OPEC has really expanded essentially to OPEC plus and now includes Russia, that means that Saudi Arabia and Russia essentially can help control global oil prices. And we've seen this really, in, in fact, in the United States in the past few years with the rise of consumer price inflation, we saw that the Biden administration was concerned about gas prices, in particular in the lead up to the midterm elections. And the Biden administration has been re releasing a lot of oil from the strategic oil reserves of the United States. Um, and we, we can also see these kinds of statements in particular when we go back and look at the Bush administration. There were numerous people involved in the Bush administration and you know the so-called war on terror who openly talked about how important it was for washington to dominate this region and i'm, I'm really thinking of in 2006 when the top u.s general and also nato leader wesley clark he famously disclosed that the bush administration had made plans to overthrow seven countries in five years and those were countries in north africa and west asia and specifically, he said the plans were to overthrow the governments of Iraq, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, and Sudan. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, sir, you got to... Come in, you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. 
So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. I said, <laughs> I said well, don't show it to me. And I saw him a year or so ago, and I said, you remember that? He said, sir, I didn't show you that memo. I didn't show it to you. Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say his name was? <laughs> I'm not going to give you his name. So go through the countries again? Well, starting with Iraq, then Syria and Lebanon, then Libya, then Somalia and Sudan, and then back to Iran. And since then, we, of course, saw the U.S. war on Iraq. We, of course, saw the proxy war in Syria that still goes on in many ways. The U.S. is occupying one third of Syrian territory, including the oil rich areas. And Trump himself, Donald Trump, boasted that he was leaving U.S. troops in Syria to take the oil. And then they'd say he left troops in Syria. You know what I did? I left troops to take the oil. I took the oil. The only troops I have are taking the oil. They're protecting the oil. I took well, over We're taking the oil. oil. We're not taking well, the oil. Well, maybe they're, we they're, will. Maybe we won't. They're I protecting mean, we, the facility. I don't know. Maybe we should take it. But we have the oil. Right now, the United States has the oil. So they say he left troops in Syria. No. I got rid of all of them other than we're protecting the oil. We have the oil. We also saw that the U.S. impose sanctions on Lebanon, which contributed to basically hyperinflation and the destruction of the Lebanese economy. And that was largely because Hezbollah is part of the government and the U.S. has been pressuring the Lebanese government to create a new government without Hezbollah. We also saw, of course, that, that NATO destroyed the Libyan state in 2011. Somalia also has a failed state. And Sudan was divided in no small part thanks to the U.S. and Israel supporting South Sudan's separatist movement on, on ethno-religious lines using religious sectarianism. So if you look at the list of countries that Wesley Clark named in 2006, the seven countries in five years, again, that was Iraq, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, and Sudan. The only country that really has been able to maintain state stability that has not been completely devastated by the United States is Iran. And of course, it took longer than five years, but the U.S. was pretty successful. And of course, Israel has played an important role in this U.S. goal to destabilize those governments in the region. Well, let's look and see how this was done. Uh, remember, after America was attacked on 9-11, uh, there was a meeting at the White House and uh, uh, everybody knew that the pilots were Saudi Arabians. And they uh, it, they knew that it was, some of the pilots had been staying at the uh, Saudi embassy in Los Angeles, I think, uh, in the United States. Uh, but uh, after 9-11, uh, there was a cabinet meeting and Rumsfeld uh, direct said uh, to the people there, uh, you look and find any link you can get to Iraq. You know, for, forget Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're, uh, we're, no problem. We want uh, Iraq is the key. And uh, he directed them to find it. And uh, the 9-11 became the excuse for uh, attacking not Saudi Arabia, uh, or, uh, but Iraq and uh, going right on with it. Well, uh, you needed a similar crisis in Libya. Uh, they said uh, in Libya, th there was uh, some, uh, I think, uh, fundamentalists uh, in the suburbs of one of the, not the capital city, uh, that were uh, causing problems. And so you have to protect the innocent people from the uh, uh, religious extremists. And uh, you go in and grab their, all of their uh, gold reserves, uh, all of their money, and you take over uh, the oil uh, on behalf of France's uh, uh, oil oil uh, uh, monopoly there. Well, this is, uh, this is the role of the fighting in uh, Gaza today. 
uh, the fighting in uh, the uh, Netanyahu's fight against Gaza is uh, being used as the excuse for America moving its warships there, its submarines, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and bombing the uh, along with Israel the. Uh, Syrian airport so that the Syrians are not able to move weapons or any kind of uh, uh, military support uh, either to Lebanon uh, to the west or Iran uh, to the east. So uh, it's obvious that uh, all of what we're seeing is somehow to soften up public opinion for the fact that, well, just like we had to uh, uh, invade Iraq because of 9-11, we have to un we have to now finally fight and take out uh, the oil uh, uh, refineries of uh, Iran and uh, their scientific institutes and any, uh, any laboratories where they may be doing atomic research. Uh, and Iran realizes this. Uh, last week, uh, uh, the uh, Iranian uh, press TV said that uh, their uh, defense minister uh, says that uh, if there's any attack on Iran, whether by Israel or by anyone else, uh, the U.S. Uh, and its uh, foreign bases are going to be hit hard. Uh, Iran, uh, Russia, China have all uh, looked at uh, the Gaza situation, not as uh, if it's an Israeli uh, uh, pro, uh, action, but as if it's it's the U.S. action, they all see exactly that it's all about Iran, uh, and that's the one that uh, the American press only says when it talks about Gaza or Hamas or Hezbollah uh, or uh, any other group. It's always uh, the Iranian tool, so and so. Uh, they're that, they're demonizing Iran in the same way that the neocons have de demonized uh, Russia to prepare for America uh, declaring an undeclared war against Iran. And, and they may even uh, de uh, declare war. Uh, last night on Wednesday uh, the 8th, uh, the Republicans had their uh, presidential debate without Trump and Nikki Haley uh, said, you know, we've got to fight Iran, we've got to conquer it. And uh, DeSantis of Florida said, yes, I uh, killed them all. He didn't say who the them was. Uh, was it Hamas? Was it everybody who lives in Gaza? Uh, was it uh, every, uh, all of the Arabs in the Near East? Just kill them all. And uh, we're really seeing something very much like uh, uh, the the Crusades here. It's a, it's a real fight for who, uh, who is going to control uh, uh, energy. Uh, because uh, again, uh, the, the key, if you can control the world's flow of energy, you can do to the whole world what the United States has did to Germany uh, last year by blowing up the Nord Stream pipelines. You can uh, grind its industry to a halt, its chemical industry, its steelmaking industry, any of its uh, uh, energy intensive industries, uh, if uh, countries do not uh, agree to US unipolar uh, uh, control. That's why uh, it wants to uh, control these areas. Well, the wild card here is, uh, is Saudi Arabia. Well, in two days on Saturday, I think you're going to have uh, the uh, uh, Iranian uh, prime minister visits uh, Saudi Arabia, and we're going to see what's going to happen. Uh, but Saudi Arabia finds that it's, uh, uh, while its role is key, Saudi Arabia could simply uh, say, we're not going to uh, export more oil until uh, the America pulls out of the Near East. But then uh, all of Saudi Arabia's monetary savings are invested in the US. The United States is, is holding the world hostage, not only by controlling its uh, oil and gas and energy, uh, but by controlling it, uh, its finance. It's like uh, you have your money in a mafia bank uh, or in uh, 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 Bankman Freed's uh, cryptocurrency uh, mutual fund. Uh, they can do whatever they want uh, with it. Uh, so I think what would happen is that's very unlikely that Saudi Arabia is ostensibly going to visibly break with the United States because it, it uh, the U.S. would uh, 
uh, hold it, uh, it hostage. But I, th I think what it would do uh, would be uh, what uh, has been talked about ever since the 1960s, uh, when uh, uh, similar problems came with Iran. And Iran's uh, ace in the hole has always been the ability to sink a ship in the uh, Hormuz, the, uh, the Hormuz Strait, where uh, the oil goes through a very narrow little strait, where uh, if you sink a tanker there or a warship, uh, it's going to block all of the sea trade uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and that would uh, certainly, number one, take uh, Saudi Arabia off the hook uh, for saying, we can't help it there. Uh, of course, we'd love to export oil, but we can't because uh, the shipping lanes are all blocked because you, America, attacked Iran and they sank, they defended themselves by sinking the ships. So you can't send your aircraft carriers and submarines uh, to attack Iran. That's very understandable. Uh, but the United, Sta uh, United States is uh, causing a world crisis. Well, obviously, the United States States knows that that's going to happen because it's been discussed literally for 50 years since I was uh, at, uh, at the Hudson Institute working on national security. It was being discussed what to do when Iran sinks the ship in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Strait of Hormuz. Uh, well, the United States figures, okay, oil prices are going to go up. And uh, uh, if uh, Iran fights back in this way, we then will have the power to do to the world what uh, we did to Germany uh, uh, t in 2022 uh, when we cut off its soil, uh, except in this case, uh, we don't take the blame. We'll say, oh, we didn't uh, uh, block uh, uh, the Saudi uh, and Arab oil trade. It was uh, that Iran that blocked it, and that's why we're going to uh, uh, bomb Iran. Uh, assuming th uh, that they can. So that, I think, is the contingency plan. Uh, and just as America had uh, a contingency plan just like that, waiting for an opportunity, like 9-11, they needed uh, a trigger, and uh, Netanyahu uh, has provided the trigger, and that's why the United States has been backing Netanyahu. And of course, Iran says, well, uh, uh, we have the ability to really wipe out Israel. And in Congress, uh, the uh, uh, General Miley and the others have all said, well, we know that uh, Israel, uh, Iran could wipe out uh, Israel. That's why we have to attack Iran. But in attacking Iran, you, you send its missiles off to Israel. And uh, again, Israel will end up being uh, the Near Eastern equivalent of the Ukraine. Uh, and uh, that sort of uh, is the plan. And I think that's uh, a lot of Israelis uh, see this and uh, they're very, they're the ones who are worried and, uh, and are opposing uh, Netanyahu and trying to prevent him from triggering a whole set of military exchanges that uh, Israel won't be able uh, to resist. And uh, even though Iran, uh, I'm sure they can bomb some places uh, in Iran, but uh, now that you have uh, uh, Russia, China, uh, all uh, supporting uh, Iran through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, you, you're having the lines being drawn very, very uh, clearly. So uh, it, it seems that this scenario is inevitable because uh, Mersheimer pointed out that it's impossible to have a negotiated solution uh, or settlement uh, uh, between uh, Israel and Palestine. He said, you can't have a two-state solution because the Palestinian state is going to be like an Indian reservation in America, uh, all sort of you know cut apart and isolated, not really a state. Uh, and you can't have uh, a single state because a single state is a theocratic state. It's like, uh, uh, again, it's like the United States in the Wild West in uh, the 19th century. And I think the way to put it in perspective uh, is uh, to, to realize that what we're seeing today in, in the attempt to split the world is very much like, <clears throat> excuse me, very much like happened in the 12th and 13th century with the Crusades. Yeah, Michael, you raise a lot of very important points there. And I know you want to talk further about the Crusades and the historical analogy. And, and I think you made a really good point about the U.S. empire standing in as the new Crusaders. But before we move away from the more contemporary political discussion, 
I wanted to to highlight two very important points that you stressed. One is not only the hydrocarbon reserves in the Middle East, which are so important for the world economy and in the U.S. attempt to maintain control over oil and gas supplies and in particular energy costs. You know, with, there's also an election coming up in 2024 and the U.S. is concerned about gas prices and inflation. And of course, energy inputs are a key factor in inflation. But but furthermore, this region is strategic because of trade routes. And of course, the Suez Canal, uh, according to, I'm looking at data here from the World Economic Forum, 30% of the world's shipping container volume transits through the Suez Canal, and 12% of all global trade consists of goods that pass through the Suez Canal. And we saw this in 2021 when there was this big you know, media scandal when a U.S. ship got stuck in the Suez Canal. And this, was, of course, also came at the time when the world was coming out of the pandemic and there were all these supply chain shocks. So we can see how sensitive the global economy is to even small issues in the global supply chain. And when you talk about shipping routes, we're not only talking about the Suez Canal, we're also talking about in the Red Sea toward the south. You also have the Bab al Mandab. This is a very important strait off of the coast of Yemen. And in the war in Yemen, starting in 2014, 2015, a lot of the fighting backed by the US in this war was in the south off of the Bab al Mandab because this is such an important strait where every single day millions of barrels of oil flow through this strait. And this also reminded me, Michael, we were talking about the historical context. And if you go back to 1956, Israel invaded Egypt. And why was that? Israel invaded yeah. Egypt because Egypt's leftist president, Nasser, nationalized the Suez Canal. And at that moment, what was very interesting is the UK and France were strongly supporting Israel in this war against Egypt because they were concerned also about Nasser's nationalization of the Suez. At that moment, the US wasn't as deeply pro-Israel as it later became. Of course, in 1967, in the Six-Day War, Israel it, it attacked the neighboring Arab states and occupied uh, part of Egypt, which the Sinai, and then also what became Gaza. Uh, Israel occupied the Golan Heights of Syria, which remain illegally occupied Syrian territory today. And Israel occupied the West Bank, what we call the West Bank today. And but another important detail about that is after the 67 war, Israel increasingly became much more of a U.S. ally, whereas the first generation of Israeli leaders were much more. They were many of them were European, whereas the later generations of Israelis have been really American. I mean, someone like Netanyahu, he, he is an American. Netanyahu was raised in the United States. He went to high school in Philadelphia. He went to high school with Reggie Jackson, by the way. He. Uh, spent his most formative years in the U.S. He went to, to college at MIT. He then worked in Boston, and he worked with many Republicans that he became friends with, like Mitt Romney, like Donald Trump. And, and then when he went back to Israel, he was sent to the U.S. to be a diplomat in the United States. So the new generation of Israeli leaders is much more you know, American, essentially. And, 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 and another detail you mentioned about Iran is so important. Because up until the Iranian revolution in 1979, the Iran of the Shah, the U.S.-backed monarchy, was such an important ally in the region. And in fact, Saudi Arabia and Iran were famously referred to as the twin pillars. Saudi Arabia was the West pillar and Iran was the East pillar that the U.S. used to try to dominate this region, of course, with the support of Israel as well. Well, with the Iranian revolution in 1979, the U.S. lost that crucial East pillar, which meant that Israel became even more important from the perspective of the U.S. imperialism to maintain control over this region. So I, I just wanted to mention those details of the strategic importance of the trade routes like the Baba Mandab Strait, like the Suez Canal, and also the fact that the Iranian revolution fundamentally shifted U.S. policy in the region and made Israel even more important for the, from the perspective of U.S. imperialism. And now we're in a moment where, as you mentioned, the U.S. is even losing control over Saudi Arabia. So it's losing both of its pillars, 
which is again why Washington is so desperate in in propping up Israel, despite the fact that the entire region is completely against these settler colonialist policies and these ethnic cleansing policies that Israel is carrying out right now as the entire world is watching. Well, to you as diplomats, uh, uh, what you call uh, the support of Israel is really uh, the support of the U.S. ability to uh, militarily control the rest of the Near East. It's all about oil. Uh, America's not support giving all this money to Israel because it loves Israel, uh, but because it 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 it, it it's, uh, Israel is uh, the uh, military base from which the United States uh, can attack Syria. Iraq and Iran and and Lebanon. So it, it's a military base, uh, uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, it the, it can frame this uh, in terms of uh, pro-Israeli, uh, pro-Jewish uh, uh, policy. But this is only uh, the. Uh, for uh, the, the public relations view of the State Department. Uh, if, if American strategy is based on energy in the Near East, then Israel is only a, uh, a means to this end. It's not the end itself. And that's why the United States needed to have uh, an aggressive uh, Israeli uh, government. You can look at Netanyahu as being, in a way, a, U, uh, a U.S. puppet, very much like Zelensky. Uh, their, their, their positions are identical in their reliance on the United States against the majority of their own people. Uh, so uh, you keep talking about uh, the uh, America's uh, support of Israel. Uh, it, it's not supporting Israel at all. It rejects uh, the majority of Israelis. It, it supports uh, the Israeli military, uh, not the Israeli society or the culture have nothing to do with Judaism at all. This is pure uh, military uh, politics, and that's how uh, I've always heard it discussed uh, 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 among the military and uh, national security people. Uh, so uh, you, uh, the, uh, you want to be careful not to uh, be taken in uh, by uh, the cover story. Uh, there, there's one other means of control I think that uh, we should mention, and that is uh, you've had in the last uh, month or so all sorts of statements by the United States that uh, as soon as uh, uh, Russia conquers uh, the, U uh, the Ukraine and solidifies its control, it's going to bring up uh, claims against uh, war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity uh, against Russia. America is trying to use the uh, crooked court system, uh, the, uh, uh, a bran the international uh, uh, criminal court is a branch of the Pentagon and the State Department, and it, it's the kangaroo court. Uh, and the idea is that somehow the kangaroo court can uh, give America uh, judgments against Putin, as they've declared him uh, to be arrested anywhere he goes, of people who respect the kangaroo court, uh, and they can have uh, all sorts of uh, sanctions against Russian uh, property elsewhere. Well, look at uh, how on earth are they going to uh, justify uh, the, these uh, claims of uh, uh, war crimes against Russia if, in the view of what's happening uh, between Israel and Gaza uh, right now. And in fact, uh, the arms and the bombs that are being used against Gaza are U.S. bombs, U.S. arms. Uh, the U.S. Is, is fueling it all. How on earth can the United States not uh, accuse itself of war crimes uh, on the very basis of what it's trying to uh, accuse Russia of? And Part of the uh, the splitting of the world that you're going to see, uh, whether or not the United States can actually uh, bomb Iran, uh, is going to be a whole setup of uh, parallel courts and an isolation, not only of the United States, but as Europe uh, is uh, coming in. And uh, basically, there's a fight for uh, who is going to control the world right now. And that's why I mentioned uh, the, the Crusades. Uh, and uh, I want to say uh, I, I've, I've been writing a history of the evolution of financial policy. Uh, I've done two volumes already, one on the Bronze Age Near East uh, and forgiven their debts, and the other on classical antiquity, the collapse of antiquity. I'm now working on uh, the third volume, which covers the Crusades to World War I. And uh, it's really 
all about uh, an attempt by Rome that had uh, hardly any uh, economic power at all to take over uh, all of the uh, uh, five Christian uh, art, uh, bishoprics uh, that were main. Constantinople was really the new Rome. That was uh, the head of Orthodox Christianity. Uh, and uh, it was the emperor of uh, uh, Constantinople was really the emperor over the whole uh, Christian world. Uh, it was followed by Antioch, uh, Alexandria, uh, and uh, 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 finally Jerusalem. Well, uh, you, you had uh, the Crusades really begin before they attacked uh, the, the Near East. It began in the uh, 11th century. And uh, the Vatican uh, was, uh, Rome was finally being attacked by the Norman and the Norman armies that were coming in and grabbing parts of France and had moved into Italy. So uh, the papacy made a deal with the uh, Norman warlords and it said, we will give you the divine right to rule. We will recognize you as the Christian king and we will excommunicate all of your enemies, but you have to pledge feudal uh, fealty, loyalty to us, and you have to let us appoint uh, uh, your bishops and control the churches, which control most of your land, and you have to pay us tribute. Uh, you, you had Rome had been uh, the papacy all during the 10th century was controlled by a small group of aristocratic families around uh, Rome that treated the papacy just as they treat uh, uh, the local uh, political, uh, the uh, mayor of a city or uh, the local administrators. The church was just sort of run by a family, had nothing to do with Christian religion at all. It was just, this is the church property and one of our relatives, uh, we're always going to have a uh, uh, head of the Pope. Well, uh, the, uh, the, the Popes didn't have any troops uh, in the uh, uh, late 11th century. And so they, they got the troops by making a deal with the Normans. And uh, they decided, okay, we're going to have an ideal. We're going to mount the Crusades and we're going to rescue uh, Jerusalem from the infidels, the Muslims. Well, the problem is that uh, Jerusalem didn't need uh, rescue because uh, all throughout the medieval world, throughout Islam, uh, throughout, uh, uh, no matter what the uh, religion of the governing classes were, there was religious tolerance. And that continued for hundreds of years under the Ottoman Empire. There was only one group that was intolerant, and that was uh, 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 the Romans that said, we have to control all of Christianity in order to prevent uh, these uh, aristocratic uh, Italian families uh, from taking over again. Uh, and so they mounted uh, the Crusades against uh, uh, nominally uh, against Jerusalem, uh, but they ended up sacking Constantinople. And two centuries later, by 1291, uh, the, uh, the, the Christians lost uh, an acre. The whole crusade against the uh, Near East failed. Uh, I think you can, you, you can see the parallel with that I'm going to be drawing. Uh, and uh, so most of the crusades were not fought against Islam because Islam was too strong. Uh, the Crusades were fought against other Christians, and uh, the fight of Roman Christianity was against old, the original Christianity uh, for itself as it existed over the last uh, 10 centuries. Well, you're having something like that today. Uh, just as uh, Rome appointed uh, Normans as feudal rulers, uh, William the Conqueror and in Sicily, uh, the U.S. appoints Zelensky, supports Netanyahu, supports... Uh, uh, cl uh, client oligarchs in Russia, uh, supports uh, Latin American uh, uh, dictators. So you have a U.S. view of the world that uh, it not only unipolar, but in order to have unipolar U.S. control of the world, the U.S. has to be in charge of treating any foreign state, any foreign uh, president as a feudal uh, 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 serf, basically, uh, that they have to, they owe feudal uh, loyalty to uh, the United States sp sponsors. Uh, and uh, just as you had the Inquisition formed in the uh, uh, 12th century, really, to enforce this uh, obedience uh, to, uh, 
to Rome uh, as opposed to uh, independent uh, southern France and uh, independent uh, uh, Italy and, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Arab science in Spain. Uh, you have today the U.S. using the National Endowment for Democracy and, and uh, uh, all of the organizations controlled by Victoria Newland with her cookies uh, to support things. Well, you're having uh, the, the whole strategy of the uh, Roman takeover, how it was going to take over other countries, how it was going to prevent other countries from becoming independent of Rome is a uh, almost uh, sentence for sentence uh, what you get in American national security reports, uh, how to control other countries. And uh, that's really the fight that we're, that we're seeing there. And against that, you're finding the fight of uh, other countries, the global majority. Uh, but in this case, the uh, uh, the uh, whereas Constantinople was looted uh, in 1204 uh, and sort of destroyed by the Fourth Crusade, uh, Russia and China and Iran and uh, the other countries have not been looted. Uh, the only thing that the United States can do right now is it's uh, setting up this military plan to attack Iran is a uh, what is the role going to be of, for instance, India? Uh, it's trying, uh, the, the the attack on Iran and on oil is at the same time an attack on uh, the Chinese-led Belt and Road Initiative. The whole attempt to control transportation, uh, not only oil, but transportation by uh, the global majority for each other's mutual growth, mutual gain, mutual uh, uh, trade. And uh, the United States is trying to uh, have an alternative plan for all of this uh, that would run from uh, uh, India, uh, essentially uh, uh, largely through Israel and uh, making a, uh, a cut right across uh, Gaza, uh, which is one of the big uh, 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 problems that are being discussed now, to uh, the Israeli control of Gaza, which would control its offshore oil and gas. So uh, you're having the wild cards in, in the U.S. Uh, plan, India, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, what will it do, uh, and Turkey, because Turkey also has an interest in this uh, uh, oil and gas. And, and uh, if the uh, uh, Islamic countries decide that they're really under attack, and they, this attack by uh, Christianity, by uh, the Christian West uh, against Islam, uh, is really a, uh, a fight to the death, then Turkey will join with Saudi Arabia and with uh, all of the other countries, uh, the Shiites and the Sunnis uh, uh, and the Alawites uh, will, will join together and say what we have uh, in common is the Islamic uh, religion. That is really going to be uh, essentially the extension of uh, uh, the America's fight against uh, China and, uh, and Russia. So uh, what we're seeing, I'm gonna try to summarize now, uh, wh what we're really seeing is uh, uh, having fought uh, Russia to the last Ukrainian and threatening to fight uh, uh, Iran to the last uh, uh, Israeli, the United States is, is trying to uh, uh, send arms to uh, Taiwan to say, wouldn't you like to fight to the last Taiwanese against uh, China? Uh, and that's really the U.S. strategy all over the world. Uh, it, it's trying to fuel other countries to fight wars for its own control. That's how Rome used the Norman armies uh, to conquer uh, southern Italy, England, and uh, uh, what, what be, uh, Yugoslavia. Israel uh, and what is in the news over the, the whole attacks in Gaza uh, is only the opening stage, the trigger, uh, for this war, just as the uh, uh, shooting of uh, uh, in Sarajevo uh, started World War I uh, in, in Serbia, uh, started everything. Well, you raised so many interesting points, Michael, and I think your analysis is very fresh and unique and very insightful. I wish we had more time to go into some of these topics, but we've already been speaking for about an hour, so I think we're going to wrap up here. But I do want to thank you, Michael, for joining us. And of course, we'll be back very soon for more analysis. For people who are interested, I actually have interviewed Michael. I did an interview recently on classical antiquity and Rome and Greece. And he's also written about the, the history of debt up through the creation of Christianity in his book, And Forgive Them Their Debts. 
And now he's working on this uh, political, economic, materialist history of the Crusades. I didn't realize when I began uh, the uh, the book in the 1980s, uh, drafting it, I didn't realize how critical uh, the uh, the Roman papacy was and how similar it was to the State Department and CIA and the blob uh, today in its plans for world conquest. Well, I'm sure in the future we will have many opportunities to discuss that research of course, for people who want to get more of Michael's uh, very important analysis, you should check out the show that he co-hosts here with friend of the show, Radhika Desai, and that is Geopolitical Economy Hour. If you go to the, our website, geopoliticaleconomy.com, or if you go to our YouTube channel, you can find a playlist with all of the different episodes of Geopolitical Economy Hour. So thanks again, Michael, and we'll definitely have you back very soon. It's good to be here. Thank you.